Um, okay, wow, this is so cool. Thank you for coming out uh, so early, especially for such a powerful topic. Um, it's a lot for first thing in the morning. So um, to kind of approach this, when David and I sat down to talk about honesty and talking about it, I asked him, uh, what's your goal for Creative Mornings here in Seattle? And his answer was this, leave a beautiful wake to change something, to move something, to leave something behind that said, I was here. That's an incredible thing. I was talking to uh, one of my friends about this recently, and she said, you know, wakes only happen in big open places, in wild places. Once you get into a harbor, a wake can't happen anymore. Wakes don't happen in familiar places. So... What does it mean to leave a beautiful wake? Not just as creative people, but as people. What does it mean for our lives, not just our work? To live a creative life, we must lose our fear of being wrong. Really easy to say, really, really hard to do. It's big, it's hard, and the bigger it is and the harder it is, is connected to how honest we're willing to be about it. Why? Because honesty makes us feel vulnerable, makes us feel exposed. It's messy. It's tricky. We don't know how to navigate honesty. But the awesome thing about it is that it also is really teaching. It's really humanizing. It's really connecting. And it's really important because inside of that space of being honest, of not knowing but trying, something happens. We see ourselves and we see each other, not for who we want to be, but for who we really are in the moment, in real life, not on social media, not in the faces and the masks and all the things we think we're supposed to be, but for who we really are. And there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of integrity. There's a lot of power. Again, easy to say, really, really hard to do. So with this, I transitioned to David Foster Wallace. Um, in 2005, David Foster Wallace gave a really big commencement speech at a really small college in Ohio. And he said, if you're worried that I'm going to tell you younger fish, what, it, what water is, because I am an older, wiser fish, don't be worried. I, too, am not a wise old fish, but I was once a young sailor. In 2001, I crewed on the ship, uh, oops, a 125-foot schooner named Westward. At the time, I was also a student at a really small liberal arts school in Ohio. And I signed up to uh, crew westward from Cape Cod up to the Grand Banks of Newfoundland through the fjords and back down. And over the course of the weeks that I was on board, I learned a lot of things about what you think looks like this, but really looks like this. I mean this literally, of course, but for the reasons that we're here today, I mean it metaphorically. This is me. <laughs> Um, charting. We did it every hour. Uh, we only checked our work uh, by GPS when we really needed to, and we did it in the traditional fashion with a compass, dividers, really simple tools that know how to do the job. It was really hard for me. Really, really hard. Felt like this. I would walk up to the chart table, have a chart, compass, dividers, I'd see the last position. I'd know what to do, and I couldn't do it. Parallels, meridians, one minute equals one mile. <laughs> I don't even know what this means. In truth, I didn't get the math. What worked in theory broke in practice, and it just it was something that I started to carry with myself so that every time I stepped up to the table, it got harder instead of getting easier. It inhibited me from being able to figure this new thing out. And the truth of it is that, in some ways, it wasn't even about navigation. 
it was about me. It was about my fear of not being good at something that I had never done before. You say it out loud, and you're like, that's crazy. That's not even realistic. But the thing is, we all do this. We all think that we're just supposed to be good at things. We're not really being honest about what it means to become good at something. And that really inhibited me. I wanted to figure it out myself. I wanted to be capable, and I wanted to know how to do this new hard thing. But the truth of the matter is that I had to get honest about that I couldn't do it by myself. I had to look to my crewmates. I had to rely on my captain. And most importantly, I had to accept that it wasn't easy, and I wasn't good at it, and that was OK. Because even though it felt super isolating, I wasn't isolated. I was part of something much bigger than myself. And we were working together inside of that thing to move forward toward a shared goal based on a shared vision and an understanding that was bigger than any one of us could ever be independently. We needed each other. We trusted each other. And those things enabled individuals to fail in certain moments, like myself, and for the whole to still move forward. And that's what enabled somebody who really, who really struggled with the chart to make way through the North Atlantic Ocean. That was almost 20 years ago. But there are things that I learned out there that have shaped who I am today and who I'll continue to become in the future. Things that have pushed me past what's comfortable into new places, new things, past what I know, past what's reasonable, past what sometimes is even possible for me. Some of those things have become clear. Some of those things are still really foggy. But the thing is, they're all worth it. So at this point, you may be saying, what does this have to do with living a creative life? I think what it has to do with is that there are things out there that I learned that represent what it means to live a creative life through being honest enough and brave enough to navigate the unknown. The first is sail by sight. So when we start something, we make a plan, we head out, and we just intuitively think that we're going to move from here to there in a straight line. But the truth of the matter is that there are always unknowns up ahead. The truth of the matter is that when we're being honest about it, we have to tack and jibe. We have to adjust and trim constantly. And we have to be honest about what we thought was going to be right in front of us is maybe over there, maybe over there, and that the only way to move forward is to be honest about when we need to change course in order to move forward. An example of this, looking at you, Oral Anderson, um, in 2014, uh, Alaska Airlines came to Hornell Anderson and they said, for 80 years, we've been making our place in the Pacific Northwest through award-winning performance and customer service, and yet things are changing. The competition is at the door. People are buying on price alone. Help us. Help us understand how to move forward. The work that Hornell Anderson did in that rebrand created a consistency across the brand, making it more relevant, consistent, in every touch point along the journey, built on the understanding of this idea that we get you. We'll meet you where we are, meet you where you are, we'll move forward together. From the face on the tail, to signage through the airport, to tickets, to bag tags, everything was consistent. Everything was in order. We thought we were going to be able to move forward. But then, in 2016, something happened. Alaska Airlines merged with Virgin America, and things changed. A whole new challenge came into sight. How to bring together two very different, very loved brands in order to do something new together. The answer was to look into what each brand was really loved for individually, being thoughtful, being vibrant, being unconventional, being themselves, and finding a way to bring that together so that the people who loved those airlines individually could love them together in a new way. So the takeaway. Chart a course. 
look ahead, but be honest about what it means to change, adjust, and move forward as you need to when you get there. One leg at a time, keep moving forward. Next, all together. It's true that the work that we do as creative people is not as physically demanding, perhaps, as sailing a tall ship through the Atlantic Ocean or any ocean for that manner, matter. But it is also true that there are things that we can accomplish together that we can never accomplish alone. All of our effort needs to be applied toward our shared goals. So, previous to moving to Seattle, I spent a lot of time uh, with another type of canvas, uh, Converse. Uh, as a member of Converse brand design, I was with the brand really soon after the Nike acquisition, and we had a lot of work to do to understand what it meant to help move that brand forward. It was a 98-year-old brand when I started. And a lot of our work, almost all of our work, was focused on this idea that was first presented in a 1913 Converse catalog. And it was this quote that said, we believe that there is an earnest demand from the retail shoe dealer to be independent enough not to follow every other brand in everything they do. This guided all of the work that we did, this idea of being independent enough not to follow. Seems like that would make you stand apart, stand alone. But in truth, it actually brought things together. This shared belief manifested in one shoe, one truth, that you could be independent enough not to follow. It brought together otherwise divergent worlds, basketball, rock and roll, badminton, art, music, a kid from Robbins, Illinois, who wrote love letters to basketball, fear and loathing, three chords in the truth, Hollywood stars, keep going. How do these things live together and make sense through time? Because they so purely understood what they were trying to achieve that it brought them together. Really powerful. This campaign was called Connectivity. It launched when Converse turned 100. And after we launched the global campaign, we took it down to the market level and around the globe, went into different cities, put out an open casting call to regular people and said, come get your picture taken, be part of this connectivity chain, join us. And then we used that for advertising um, and for brand building. So again, one idea, adopted and applied in your own individual way. The takeaway there, when you feel like you're your own thing, it can make you feel like you're a part. Being honest about that is really hard. But being brave enough to show that to the world can unite you with others who believe that too, even though they share that in their own ways. Number three, sing out. Now it's true, if there are any sailors in the room, that when you haul together, you always sing out. It helps you bring your energy and your strength together. But for the purposes of this conversation, I want to approach sing out a little bit differently. Back to Westward for a minute. This was our captain. His name is Sean Burkaw. He has been uh, a sailor for his whole life. He um, went with his family when he was eight years old, circumnavigated for three and a half years, uh, and that set the course of his life. He is everything that you would expect a captain to be. Strong, steady, sometimes even scary. But on this day, he was something really different than that. Uh, this photo was taken uh, in a squall off Cape Brenton Island, and I was what they, um, I was in the galley that day, and it was really bumpy, and people were feeling really seasick, and just kind of getting knocked around, generally feeling really uncomfortable. And I went up on deck, and uh, he was sitting on the bowsprit by himself, red foul weather gear, fog, pea soup, everywhere. He was alone. 
It was really, really quiet. And he was singing. You could hardly hear it. He was singing. He was singing into the storm. This is a moment that I've never forgotten in my life. This idea of singing into the storm. This idea of singing into the challenges of our lives, whether that's professionally, personally, whatever that may be. It's an incredible thing that as I reflect on this, I think about the power of choice. I think about what we are normally and naturally inclined to do with challenge. And then I remember this. And I think about how there's another way. This is Ronnie, Ronnie Hong. When Ronnie was seven, she was sold into slavery uh, and, and lived years in uh, what is referred to as modern-day slavery. Uh, through a miraculous twists of fate and unexpected events, she escaped and survived. And today, she is a UN ambassador and the founder of the Trani Foundation, which its purpose is to end modern day slavery by 2030. Ronnie came to Hornell Anderson a few years ago uh, with a request to help her with some speech writing uh, that would be given at the UN and at the Vatican around supply chain transparency, what that means uh, for modern day slavery and the products that we wear every day without even realizing the implications of how they were made. And it was an incredible experience in the things that we've been talking about, trust, transparency, vulnerability, courage, to share her story with us so that we could share it with the world and hopefully impact the stories of, at the time, what were 45 million people. 45 million people who are modern-day slaves at the time that we worked together. And she would talk about this idea of being the light, not the flies in the eyes, that that was a choice for her to say, I, I was a slave, but I'm also now a leader. I was a victim. Now I'm an advocate, and I am the change. My choice, my power. Really, really powerful stuff. Uh, so the takeaway here, there is great hope even inside great adversity. We can forget that because it's just not how we think about challenge, it's not how we think about storms. But it's there for us. And it's there for us individually and together as teams, as communities, as people, all inside of this human experience. So to recap, sail by sight, haul together, sing out. Again, very simple words, very, very difficult to be honest about in our lives. Um, a lot of days, I don't think I do a very good job with these things, uh, even though I know they're really important. But what I think is cool is that we get to practice every day. Every day we get a new chance in our work, in our lives, to do these things individually and together. To return to David Foster Wallace once again and his incredible speech, This is Water. Read it if you have never read it. It's a gift. Um, he says, what we don't know yet are the stakes of the struggle. And what I'd add to that is the opportunity and the invitation and the gift. So, consider this an invitation to be a little bit more honest, to be a little bit more open, a little bit more vulnerable, a little bit more brave, to not know and to go find out. I'll leave with that. I was thinking about this uh, last night and this morning. Um, <laughs> I figured there'd probably be a question like this. Uh, and I, I think the prevailing thought that I have is in the relationship between what and how. 
you know, like we can know things, but we still have to understand how to deliver them so that they land in a way that can be received. Um, so I think for me, it's again, that practice of saying, if I know this thing, it has to be two steps. And it works better when you're able to pause between those steps, think about your audience, and then work back to yourself and, and then move forward to that delivery. So being able to flex the how of it, um, which can only happen when you understand your audience, which I think goes back to some of that hall together thinking um, as far as how limiting it can be when we only see things our way. Um, but that if we can find ways, um, or at least work on finding ways, to understand what's shared inside of the disparate perspectives or approaches, uh, it has a better opportunity to find a place where it can be received and then applied. Yes. Mm -hmm. Her question is, how do you get brands to understand the importance and value of being honest um, through the work? I would look over to the left at Mr. Ewan Frazier, who's a strategy director at Horner Landerson. Horner Landerson has a very deep strategy practice, uh, and that's where we always begin. Uh, as you know, the work of strategy is to really find that truth, um, which is both a human truth and a brand truth and how those things come together. So I would say that working closely with strategy to understand what those truths are as a foundation and then finding those points to come back to that as a building block as we move forward into creative expression. Um, say it, say it again, say it again. Um, reminding people to make those connections or clients or brands to make those connections that can just get lost in the process is a really helpful way to make sure that um, we're staying true to what we started with or what we know is honest about the work. Any other questions? Yes. I think, um, I think that we're living in times that are understanding more and more all the time what it means to be honest, um, what it means to express honesty, how difficult that can be, um, how important that is to do. Uh, I guess I feel like an increasing awareness and sensitivity to how the work that we do inside of our teams or inside of our agencies or groups or companies or relationships, um, there's just this ripple effect that is breaking down the walls between what's inside and what's outside. And the sensitivities and awarenesses that we are aware of in our lives, in our communities, in this world, are kind of moving back and forth through the work and through the conversations, perhaps in a different sort of way than they have previously. Um, I'm not sure. I think that Conversations are changing, um, awarenesses are changing, and people are searching, we're all searching to find how they fit together. Questions? Thoughts? Yes? I did not. <laughs> um, no, that was at Kenyon. I went to a college called the College of Worcester. Um, so I did not, although I really wish that I could have. Um, I actually was given um, a copy of it a couple years ago uh, when we were working with Ronnie, actually, um, by a friend. And I didn't read it until much later than that. And then I read it again in preparation for um, this talk. And it was just such a wonderful piece to kind of hold. I put it in my line of sight at work to just uh, to remember these things. This is water. This is water. This is water. It's so simple. It's so powerful. Oh, 
Okay. Thank you.